Welcome to the second episode in our complete AWS ECS series. In the previous video, we covered the most important concepts of ECS to give you a solid understanding. If you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend starting there, the link is in the description below. Starting with this video, we'll move into the hands-on part of the series. So, let's begin by understanding the core components of Amazon ECS. There are four core components in Amazon ECS that you need to understand. We will discuss them in the order below. First one is ECS cluster. Second, ECS task definition. Then, ECS task. And ECS service. In ECS, all these components work together to define what your containers do, where they run, and how they're managed efficiently. So, in this video, we'll take a closer look at the ECS cluster, and we'll walk through the process of creating an ECS cluster from scratch. Let's break down what an ECS cluster really is. First, an ECS cluster is a logical container for managing your compute resources, either EC2 instances or Fargate tasks. It acts as the execution environment, meaning this is the place where ECS launches, runs, and manages your tasks and services. Importantly, it doesn't directly store containers. Instead, it keeps track of where containers should run and helps ECS schedule them on the right infrastructure. Every ECS task or service must run inside a cluster. You can't deploy anything in ECS without associating it with a cluster. And finally, a single cluster can support multiple services and tasks at the same time. So, you don't need a new cluster for every app, you can group related workloads together for better resource utilization. To make it easier to understand, let's use a real-world analogy. You can think of an ECS cluster as an office building. The office building provides the space and essential resources, like rooms, desks, internet, and electricity, but it doesn't actually do the work. Similarly, an ECS cluster doesn't run containers itself, but provides the environment, using EC2 instances or Fargate, where containers can run. Just like employees must work inside the office building, all of your containers must run inside the ECS cluster. Nothing operates outside of it. And just like a building can host multiple departments working in different rooms, an ECS cluster can run multiple tasks and services, all sharing the available compute and network resources efficiently. This analogy helps us see that the ECS cluster is not where the work is done, it's the foundation and infrastructure that makes the work possible. Now let's talk about why the ECS cluster is such an important part of the architecture. An ECS cluster is more than just a container for compute, it's the foundation of everything in ECS. Without a cluster, ECS wouldn't know where or how to run your containers. It helps you organize resources, whether you're using EC2 or Fargate, by grouping them into a manageable unit. ECS then uses this cluster to schedule tasks smartly. When you run a task, ECS automatically decides the best place to run it, whether that's on an EC2 instance with enough free resources or a Fargate slot ready to go. It checks for available CPU, memory, and placement strategies, then chooses the most optimal location. As your application scales, the cluster allows you to scale your tasks and infrastructure as needed. It also serves as the scope for monitoring, health checks, and logging, making it easier to troubleshoot and maintain. You can run multiple services within a single cluster, allowing ECS to manage and scale them together efficiently. This is useful when services are closely related or share infrastructure. Alternatively, you can create separate clusters for development, testing, and production environments. This helps keep workloads isolated, improve security, and ensures better control over resource usage and deployments. Now let's look at the launch types or the capacity providers, supported by Amazon ECS. Amazon ECS supports three main capacity providers. First, we have the EC2 launch type, where you manage the underlying infrastructure by yourself using Amazon EC2 instances. Second, there's the Fargate launch type, which is serverless, you don't manage the infrastructure at all, just the tasks. And finally, there's the external launch type, which lets you run ECS tasks on your own on-premises servers using ECS Anywhere. To understand the EC2 launch type, let's go back to our office analogy. Think of it like renting and managing an entire office building yourself. You're responsible for setting it up, maintaining it, and making sure everything runs smoothly. You decide everything, the layout, the desks, 
the power, the internet, and even cleaning. In ECS terms, that means you manually provision EC2 instances, handle scaling, patch the OS, and manage networking. This gives you more control and flexibility but also means more responsibility. For example, if you want to run a web app, you'd launch EC2 instances inside a cluster and deploy your containers there. You decide how many machines to run, how to scale, and how to secure them. Now let's look at the Fargate launch type. Imagine you don't want to own an office, instead, you rent desks in a fully managed co-working space, like WeWork. You just send in your employees with instructions. You don't worry about electricity, cleaning, or IT, the provider takes care of it all. That's exactly how AWS Fargate works. You define what your container needs, and AWS handles the rest, provisioning compute, scaling, patching, and networking. It's a great choice when you want to focus only on your application, not on managing infrastructure. For example, you can deploy the same web app as before, but this time you don't touch any EC2 instances, Fargate runs your containers for you. Lastly, we have the external launch type, also known as ECS Anywhere. This is like setting up your own private office off the grid. You build the space, install the power, networking, security, everything is fully owned and operated by you. In the ECS world, this means running the ECS agent on your on-premises servers and connecting them to your ECS cluster. This approach gives you maximum control and is ideal for hybrid environments, edge locations, or companies with strict data residency requirements. For instance, if you have workloads that need to run in your local data center for compliance reasons, you can still manage them through ECS while keeping them physically on-premises. Alright, now let's jump into the hands-on part creating our first ECS cluster. I'll walk through the step-by-step -step process of setting up a cluster in the AWS Management Console. Head over to the Amazon ECS Console. From the left-hand sidebar, click on Clusters. Click the Create Cluster button to start the setup process. Give this cluster a meaningful name. For now, you can skip the Service Connect default namespace option. We'll cover this feature in more detail in an upcoming video when we dive into ECS networking. From the infrastructure section, you can choose where your containers should run. There are two main options available. First one is AWS Fargate. Second one is Amazon EC2 instances. These are the two primary launch types we already discussed in detail previously in this video. If you're using on-premises servers with ECS Anywhere, you can register those external instances after the cluster has been created. Fargate is a serverless, pay-as-you-go compute engine provided by AWS. With Fargate, you don't have to worry about provisioning or managing servers. It handles everything. By default, when you create a new ECS cluster, it comes pre-configured with Fargate and Fargate spot capacity providers. This lets you start running containers immediately without managing any infrastructure. Amazon EC2 instances give you full control over the compute environment. You choose the instance type, how many instances to run, and you're responsible for managing that capacity, including scaling, updates, and security patches. This option offers more flexibility and control, but also requires more operational overhead compared to serverless options like Fargate. When you select the EC2 launch type, you'll notice that there are a lot more configuration options to fill out. That's because with EC2, you are responsible for managing the infrastructure. On the other hand, with the Fargate launch type, there's minimal setup required, because AWS handles all the infrastructure behind the scenes for you. You can associate both Fargate and EC2 capacity providers with the same ECS cluster. This allows you to run some tasks on Fargate and others on EC2, depending on your needs. So, for this video, I'll be using only the EC2 launch type for our setup. From the Auto Scaling Group workflow, you can configure the properties for the Auto Scaling Group, which acts as the capacity provider when using the Amazon EC2 launch type. Since I haven't created an Auto Scaling Group for this setup yet, I'll create a new one from here. Under Provisioning Model, you can choose between on-demand instances or spot instances. For this demo, we'll leave the default selection as on-demand. 
Container Instance Amazon Machine Image refers to the Amazon ECS optimized AMI used for the EC2 instances in your auto scaling group. These AMIs come pre configured with all the necessary ECS agents and settings. For this setup, we'll leave the default selection. Leave the default selection for EC2 instance type. EC2 instance role is the IAM role assigned to the EC2 instances in your ECS cluster. It grants the necessary permissions for the ECS container agent and Docker daemon to communicate with ECS and perform actions on your behalf. For this demo, I'll create a new role specifically for this setup. Desired capacity refers to the number of EC2 instances your auto scaling group will start with. You also set the minimum and maximum number of instances to allow scaling within that range. For the group to scale out, the maximum must be greater than zero. For this demo, I'll set the minimum to one and the maximum to two instances. This SSH key pair is used to securely connect to your EC2 instances and verify your identity. You can create a new key pair in the Amazon EC2 console if you don't have one already. Since I've already created a key pair, I'll select it from the available list. The root EBS volume is the main storage attached to your EC2 instance. It contains the operating system, Docker images, and metadata needed for the instance to run. By default, this volume is set to 30 GB. I'll leave this field blank so it will automatically use the default size of 30 GB. Using the network settings for Amazon EC2 instances workflow, you can select the VPC and subnets where your EC2 instances will be launched. By default, instances launch in the default VPC for your chosen AWS region. Since I haven't created a VPC yet, we'll create a new one now. Click Create a new VPC. Select VPC and more. Give your VPC a name. Choose two availability zones. Create two public subnets and two private subnets. No need to add a NAT gateway for this setup. Skip creating VPC endpoints and then create the VPC. Once created, update the VPC settings to enable auto-assign public IP for the two public subnets. Now, go back to the ECS console, refresh the drop-down list, and select your newly created VPC. From the subnets drop-down, select the two public subnets we just created. Since we haven't created a security group yet, click Create New Security Group to create one. Give it a meaningful name. Add an inbound rule, choose HTTP as the type, and set the source to anywhere to allow public web traffic. This security group controls network traffic for the EC2 instances running your containers, not for the containers themselves. Auto-assign public IP option controls whether your EC2 instances get a public IPv4 address. Instances need a public IP if they must be accessible from the internet. Since we've already configured our subnets to auto-assign public IPs, we'll use the default subnet settings here, so no change is needed. In the monitoring section, you have the option to enable CloudWatch container insights for detailed metrics and logs. However, we won't enable it in this video since we'll cover ECS monitoring more thoroughly in a future episode. Encryption settings are important for securing your data, but we won't cover them in this video. We'll dive deeper into encryption and other security best practices in a future video focused on ECS security. Tags are labels you can assign to your ECS clusters to help organize and manage them, especially useful when you have many clusters. In this demo, I'll add a simple tag called ECS POC. You can see these tags on your ECS cluster page under the Tags tab. Since we've completed all the configurations for our ECS cluster, let's go ahead and create it. You can see the cluster creation process in the ECS console. So, AWS automatically provisions your cluster by creating a CloudFormation stack in the background. We'll cover CloudFormation in a separate video series, so I'm not diving into it now. 
Once the cluster is created, notice that there are no tasks or services running yet inside the cluster. Because we selected the EC2 launch type, AWS has launched the EC2 instances and created an auto-scaling group as part of this cluster setup. If you go to the EC2 console, you'll notice that an EC2 instance has been launched automatically. You'll also see a new auto-scaling group created for this setup. Along with that, a launch template has been created, which the auto-scaling group will use whenever it needs to scale out. Also, navigate to the IAM console to verify that the necessary IAM roles for ECS have been created automatically. So, this completes the cluster creation process and sets the foundation to deploy containers on. Alright, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.